So this is our final week of Advent and, uh, and our final week of the series Created to Create, where we've been looking at um, kind of the Advent virtues from the perspective of some of the most successful songwriters in history. Um, Esther and I were driving around with our four youngest kids on Wednesday, um, because when you've only got four kids, man, you can just go anywhere. That's like nothing. And, uh, and we were delivering some of Esther's um, goodie bags uh, to some friends and family, and we, uh, what struck me as we were trying to find Christmas music for the entire trip, because it was a pretty long drive, um, is how small the canon of Christmas music really is. Like, it's really just a small number of songs that everyone in history feels like they have to cover. So um, what seems like a lot of selection is actually just a lot of repetition. But what was more interesting to me was the way that um, some songs have risen to the top of, like, Christmas regulars, while others have just kind of faded into obscurity. So somehow Mariah Carey's Christmas song is now um, on, you know, they just play it every other song. Um, and Bobby Helm's Captain Santa Claus from 1957 does not get regular play. Has anyone heard this song? We bumped into it on accident. Um, listen to how the chorus of this little gym goes. Hooray for Captain Santa Claus and his reindeer space patrol. His sleigh broke down on Christmas Eve as he started from the pole. He said those children's hearts will break if I don't make this trip. But Santa's helpers saved the day when they built a rocket ship. (laughs) Then with his reindeer space cadets, he took off through the air. Not one chimney did he miss. Every stocking got its share. Now children dance around with glee, uh, or dance with glee around the tree, each time they are told the tale of Captain Santa Claus and his reindeer space patrol. I mean, I don't know how that did not make it in to get regular play. How did that slip through the cracks? Um, but for the past three weeks, we've been diving into like some real golden oldies. The lectionary has assigned us songs that were written 3,000 years ago, um, which I would assume is every artist's dream. Um, actually, I cannot imagine a single artist alive today, except for maybe Kanye, who thinks their music will still be listened to <laughs> in 3,000 years. But uh, just for some comparison, if you want to just talk about art, um, just for some comparison, this, this, these songs were written about 1,000 BC, um, so about 3,000 years ago. And if, if we were studying visual art from this same era, it would look something like this. So it would be you know, two-dimensional paintings on a cave wall. And visual art has grown to this. Has anybody ever seen this? This is not a picture of of, uh, Morgan Freeman. This is is a doodle somebody did on an iPad with a little drawing app. There's actually one of those videos of it sped up if you want to go online and watch it. This is a drawing. So um, it's actually pretty fascinating. You should look it up on YouTube, watch them actually make this. It's kind of cool. So they created this hyper-realist piece um, there's actually uh, a, a great video. So visual art has gone from two-dimensional drawings on a cave wall to hyper-realistic um, drawings on an iPad. And lyrical art has gone from unfailing love and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours out his blessings to I don't want a lot for Christmas. There's just one thing I need. I don't care about the presents underneath the Christmas tree. And if I don't stop, you guys will start singing. Um, so yeah, maybe lyrical art has not kept up with, with visual art. But um, as I've explained a few times over the past couple months during Advent and Lent, we like to sync up with churches that follow the lectionary um, so that we're studying the same uh, passages this morning uh, that all liturgical churches will be, will be studying. So we're reading the same song that millions and millions of Christians around the world are singing or reading, which I, I think is, is cool. So this morning, um, we've tweaked it just a little so that we're looking at these psalms, not necessarily from a theological perspective. We are touching that a little bit, but mostly from the perspective of what the songwriter might have been trying to express about their relationship with God and how it impacted their understanding of hope and peace and joy and this week love. So um, we read one songwriter uh, who was asking God for blessings on future generations as an expression of hope, that our best hope is in the kids, in the, in, uh, in the next generation. Uh, we read a songwriter who looked forward to the day when God would bring together the tensions that seemed to tear us apart 
um, into this uh, beautiful wholeness, this shalom, this peace. And then last week we, uh, we marched along with the kind of worn out, travel sore pilgrims on the road to Jerusalem um, as the psalmist chants some music. Uh, uh, experts believe it was, it was more chanted than sung. Um, and the lyrics aren't theologically deep, but like all pop music, they keep you moving um, when you're tempted to quit. Um, the author of Psalms 126 not only keeps his people marching, but he also fixes their eyes on this party, this festival that is ahead of them. If, if they make it through this long walk and get to Jerusalem, there will be this amazing festival. Because sometimes we dance for joy, and when we can't dance for joy, we sing about a day when we will dance with joy. Well, this week we're looking at folk music. Any folk fans? Anybody grew up listening to folk music? I grew up listening to Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and Loggins and Messina, James Taylor, of course, Dan Fogelberg. Um, folk music is this music that generally tells a story. Um, it has a narrative quality to it. And more than that, it's supposed to come with a lesson or, or a glimmer of wisdom somehow. For instance, the scariest and most painful song ever. Any guesses? Cats in the Cradle. Anybody ever heard Cats in the Cradle? Oh my gosh. It's, it tracks a dad who whose kid is trying to play with him and he can't because he's too busy. He wants to play with the kid, but just life is so busy and not today, son. And then and at the end of each exchange, the kid's like, someday I'm going to be just like my dad. And the song painfully ends with the, the kid as a teenager and then an adult and doesn't have time for his dad. His dad's trying to spend time with him. And the dad has this revelation that uh, his kid actually did turn out just like him. And holy moly, does that hurt. Um, well, today's Psalm, uh, Psalm 89 is that type of song. It's a, in biblical nerd language, if you're into that, it's a mascal. Um, we call it a mascal, which means a psalm of wisdom. Um, and the lectionary only actually gives us like 12 verses of it. It gives us like a little piece of it. And so earlier in the week, I studied out my 12 verses. I went to the commentaries and I, I did a little bit of word study and, uh, and uh, read what some other people had to say about it and started writing. On Thursday, I started writing and I got about two hours in and, uh, and I opened my paper Bible, which I don't do often, and I realized there's actually 52 verses in this psalm. I'm so used to reading things on a screen that scrolls that sometimes you forget that there's more scrolling to do. I kind of read the part I was supposed to read and didn't realize there's more I could have scrolled. So I had to actually kind of scrap my message two hours in because uh, as I read this psalm, I found out it was quite different than the, than the 12 verses the, the lectionary was giving us. And since in this study, we're trying to kind of focus on the art itself. I felt it was important we treat with the entire psalm. So, um, so I kind of, uh, I kind of uh, uh, decided to, to go with the whole psalm, but we're not going to read all 52 verses, but I do recommend you do that um, whenever you get a chance. So the first thing we need to do is look at the songwriter. Um, it says, this is a song of Ethan the Ezraite. Um, and Ethan the Ezraite, which is, turns out to be a little bit important. Um, the psalm itself uh, tells us who wrote it, and this is... Uh, it's kind of a big deal because it places it in the Bible. We know where this psalm falls now. In 1 Kings, there's a passage just trying to emphasize just how wise Solomon is, just how impressive this dude is. And it says this, God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as fast as the sands of the seashores. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all wise men from the east and wise men from Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite. And the sons of Mahal, Hermon, and, and all these other guys. So uh, we, don't have, we don't know a lot about Ethan, um, but if we're going just off of context, if you're trying to make a point about just how vast the wisdom of Solomon um, really is, um, and the way you do it is by going, believe it or not, this dude is even wiser than Ethan the Ezraite. Um, that means Ethan's pretty darn wise. Um, so the fact that we're reading a mascal, a song of wisdom, um, written by a guy who scored maybe one point lower than Solomon on the ACT, means this is probably a decent vehicle for wisdom. This, this psalm is, has credibility as a mascal. But even more importantly than Ethan's credibility, this tells us where this falls in the story, in the, in the biblical narrative, which we're going to draw out later, because I do think that is important. Ethan was likely old when, uh, when Solomon reigned. Um, when Solomon was kind of compared to him in wisdom, which means he probably lived through at least part of David's reign and some of Solomon's reign. He probably overlapped David and Solomon, um, which is important, especially as we talk about how this might apply to us um, in Advent in 2020. So let's look at the opening of the song. 
I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your, fa- your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen servant. I've sworn this oath to him. I will establish your descendants as kings forever. They will sit on the throne from now until eternity. Selah. This is how it starts. Um, this is talking about the Davidic covenant. We talked about this several weeks ago. And, and the fact that this is a huge moment in the Jewish story, maybe the hugest moment in the Jewish story. David has taken the throne. Um, he had conquered Jabus and converted it to Jerusalem. He found a home for the ark. He began to make plans for the temple. And he went to Nathan the prophet to kind of get permission from God to start this huge work. And Nathan tells him in their conversation that God is going to give David more than just, a, make him more than just a king. He's going to make him the first in an eternal dynasty. And this is kind of huge news. It's it really for David, it's amazing news. David had no reason to expect that his son might take the throne. You got to think about it. In terms of kings of Israel, there had only been one and his son didn't take the throne. And so as far as David knows, there's going to be a war every time there's a new king because there's there has never been a dynasty in, in Israel, so it had never been established. And so David has no reason to automatically expect that his kids are going to follow after him, that there's going to be some form of dynasty. So to have God show up and go, you're not only going to be king, but your, your, your heirs are also going to reign is a pretty big deal. So for Nathan to tell David that God plans to give him an heir that will sit on the throne forever is really good news. And as Ethan Um, Psalms 89's author clearly indicates this is good news for all of Israel. Uh, The peaceful transfer of power, um, which has kind of become a cornerstone of of modern developed nations, was a pipe dream 3,000 years ago. Like there there was no such thing as a peaceful transfer of power. And so for a nation to hear um, that there would be an heir of David on the throne forever um, means they don't have to go through civil war. They don't have to go through overthrows and I mean it's a, it's big news for the future of Israel and uh, and it, it's pretty important uh, in fact even in America where we know that uh, peaceful transfer of power is kind of the bedrock of our whole system we can kind of see how how even choosing a new leader every four years can rip a country apart can really tear and so to, for, for Israel to hear that's not going to happen you're going to have an eternal um, dynasty uh, it, it means peace for a nation it's it's really big news So imagine the relief of hearing God say that um, you don't have to be torn apart anymore. Um, God is going to choose a leader who will reign forever. There won't be um, any more of that conflict. Well, this idea absolutely explodes in the minds of the psalmists. Um, From from the point where they get this news, we call them messianic psalms. Um, these, These songwriters we're trying to imagine what an eternal kingdom might look like. And they, and they wrote about it. And the Holy Spirit kind of used this, this imagination to, to write some of the clearest prophecies of Jesus that are in the scripture, except for maybe um, in Isaiah. And, and it was all kind of based on the fact that they had, they had grabbed hold of this idea that there would be an eternal king in Israel and, and what that might look like, because nobody really had thought of that kind of concept before. Um, in fact, based on these couple of verses, it's pretty clear um, why this is an Advent reading. Um, and, and, it, uh, and the fact that Ethan translates this news into love. He says, I'll sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your, your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. So Ethan, is, who is so wise, he's compared to Solomon to make sure we know how so- wise Solomon is recognizing that God establishing an eternal king is an act of love. It's not just God saying, I want this guy. It's God saying, I love you so much, I'm not going to let you be ripped apart by this anymore. I'm going to establish a king. Ethan sees this as a huge act of love. Your unfailing love lasts forever. So Ethan established that God, um, God's promise is an eternal king, uh, and that's what motivates this outpouring of love. Then he goes on to talk out in very poetic language about how amazing God is. I'm not going to read this part. It takes a while. He says stuff like, you rule the oceans. You've crushed the great sea monsters. You've scattered your enemies with a mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth are yours. The entire universe is yours. You created north and south and, and, and all these things. And he goes on and on and on. After a couple of big flourishes, he emphasizes the whole statement of how amazing God is with this statement. Yes, 
Your, uh, our protection comes from the Lord, and he, the Holy One of Israel, has given us a king. So all of this amazing stuff about God is, is wrapped up and motivated and driven by God's promise for a king. Um, so it's clear that all this adoration is focused on this promise. Ethan digs into uh, next. He says, long ago you spoke in a vision of your faithful people. You said, I have raised up a warrior. I have selected from him the common people of, uh, to be a king. I have found my servant David. I have anointed him with holy oil. I will steady him with my hand. With my powerful arm, I will make him strong. His enemies will not defeat him, nor will the wicked overpower him. I will beat down his adversaries before him and destroy those who would hate him. My faithfulness and unfailing love will be with him. And my authority, um, he will grow, and by my authority he will grow in power. I will extend his rule over the sea, his dominion over the rivers. He will uh, call out to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn son, the mightiest king on earth. I will love him and will be kind to him forever. My covenant with him will never end. I will preserve an heir for him. His throne will be as endless as the days of heaven. So you see how this is starting to tell a story. Um, uh, Ethan is telling a story of something that's already happened. God's promise to, to David. It's, it's, you know, it's starting to sound like a Fogelberg song. You know, met my old lover in the grocery store. You know. <laughs> In the snow on Christmas Eve. You know, he's telling a story with his music here. Now, incidentally, this is where the lectionary reading stops. It kind of gives you just that piece. And, uh, and I was really happy with this psalm. You know, it, 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 we get to sit and look. We get to worship the object of these promises, which is awesome. 3,000 years later, and it's very Christmassy, and I love it. But the psalm goes on. And it actually takes a weird turn. It gets a little bit dark. Um, here's where Ethan's art goes from uh, actually um, kind of what fits Christmas to the confusing part. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but, uh, uh, but I do need to read a fairly decent chunk of it. He says, I have sworn an oath to David. My holiness, I cannot lie. His dynasty will go on forever. His kingdom will endure as the sun. It will be as eternal as the moon, my faithful witness in the sky, Selah. So far, so good. It sounds like everything else we've read. It fits the Christmas narrative. And then he says the next verse, but now you've rejected him, cast him off. You're angry with your anointed king. You've renounced your covenant with him. You've, you've thrown his crown in the dust. You've broken down the walls protecting him and ruined every, uh, and ruined every fort defending him. Everyone has come along and robbed him. He's become a joke to his neighbors. You have strengthened his enemies. You've made them all rejoice. You've made his sword useless and refused to help him in battle. You've ended his splendor and overturned his throne. You've made him old before his time and publicly disgraced him. Selah. Oh Lord, how long will this go on? Will you hide yourself forever? How long will your anger burn like a fire? Remember how short life is. How empty and futile this human existence is. No one can live forever. All will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Salah. Lord, where is your unfailing love? You promised it to David with a faithful pledge. Consider, Lord, how your servants are disgraced. I carry in my heart the insults of so many people. Your enemies have mocked me, O oh Lord. They mocked your anointed king wherever he goes. You see why we don't include this part in Christmas? <laughs> now, prophetically, this is a flat-out miraculous piece of literature. Um, the, that portion that I just read has to perfectly sum up the way the disciples felt when they watched Jesus get arrested and horribly beaten and eventually crucified. Like, to be 100% convinced that the promised king had arrived and, and, and you're relishing in this kind of amazing moment in the Jewish history where this, this king that they've been talking about for over 3,000 years is on the scene, and, and then you watch him get arrested. And this has to be how they felt. Like, what just happened? You made promises. What is going on? But for this study, we're trying to get into the, to the heart of the artist. And so I love that this is an amazing prophetic piece, and it really does kind of outline Jesus' story. It's amazing how well it fits a thousand years ahead of time where, where 
he shows up and fulfills his promise, but then everything kind of goes weirdly haywire. But we want to know what's going on in Ethan's head. We want to look at the art. And though I don't doubt for one second the Holy Spirit is writing about Jesus in this passage, I think Ethan has something else in mind. Um, I told you that finding out where Ethan lived uh, in the narrative might prove helpful to understanding this psalm. And here's why I say that. After David received the promise that he was um, going to have an eternal dynasty, he made some mistakes. Some of the stories we know well about David came right after this. Um, he made some uh, absolute moral mistakes. Um, he kind of had some big failures with his family um, and, uh, and kind of made some bad leadership decisions that led to some judgment. Um, and to David's surprise, kind of out of nowhere, his oldest son Absalom stages a coup and takes over the kingdom. David is forced into exile. So David and his men leave in exile. And as they're leaving, um, there was these people, there was this guy that was cursing David as he, as he was walking out of Jerusalem. And David's men wanted to kill the guy. They were like, let us kill him. And David's like, no, I deserve this. I earned this. And so he just let this guy curse him. And so Ethan's reference to the, that mocking and that cursing, I think places this psalm in this story. We know it fits perfectly into Ethan's life. And Ethan seems to be describing this surprise fall from grace. So David's in exile, fallen from a throne in a palace to sleeping under the stars on the hard ground again. And so imagine his wise advisor, Ethan, laying up at night, uncomfortable on the hard earth, trying to make sense of what just happened. They had, they had all gotten sloppy. They knew that. They'd made mistakes. And why not? God had promised an eternal throne. So what happened? I mean, Nathan, the, the, the prophet of God, had given God's word. So how in the world am I out here outside of Jerusalem when we were promised an eternal throne? But now you have rejected him and cast him off. You are angry with your anointed king. You've renounced your covenant with him. You've thrown his crown in the dust. You've broken down the walls protecting him and ruined every fort defending him. Everyone who comes along has robbed him. He has become a joke to his neighbors. A lot of David's psalms, uh, psalms of lament where he's, he's crying out to God are written in this season, what we call the second exile of David. Um, and I think Ethan is writing this psalm in the tension between what God has promised and what he sees with his own eyes. He's writing this psalm to describe that tension. And this is what Advent waiting is all about. Because God sent Jesus. The Prince of Peace has come. The Savior of the world is risen. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are buried with Christ and raised again to newness of life. But, and isn't that a horrible word, but? I don't always feel peace, despite the fact that the Prince of Peace has come. The world sure doesn't look saved even though the Savior of the world is risen. Old things don't seem very present and not much feels new. It's not that I don't believe. I absolutely do. It's just that what I see doesn't match what God has said. And the difference between those two realities hurts. And Ethan is capturing that in his art. The pain of when the things that God has said don't match what I see. And this, uh, uh, this last line of the psalm, though, is what I truly love. After opening with an amazing declaration that he will sing of the never-ending love of God forever, then laying out how amazing God is for loving and caring for his people and seeing that they will have an eternal king, then being honest enough to admit that that promise wasn't making much sense in his current circumstance, Ethan wraps up the whole thing like this. Actually, I'm going to read the verse before just to set it up. He says, your enemies have mocked me, O Lord. They mock your anointed king wherever he goes. Praise the Lord forever. Amen and amen. This is actually awesome. Ethan winds up right where he started. If you read this psalm all the way through, it feels like Ethan starts real high and then drops slowly into the dumps, but that couldn't be farther the truth. Ethan started out praising God, and he ended praising God. If this is a mystical 
a song of wisdom, it should come with a bit of a lesson, and this is what I think that lesson is. It is perfectly acceptable, probably recommended, that we give full voice to our confusion and our frustration when the promises of God don't seem to match up with the world that we see with our eyes. But in the end, that changes nothing. In the end, that doesn't change our role a bit. When everything makes sense to me and your promises are falling all over me, I praise you for your unfailing love. And when I'm angry and I'm confused and nothing makes sense and I can't even dream up a way in which your promises might come to pass, I praise you for your unfailing love. One of the best pieces of marriage advice I've ever gotten, I've just been married a couple weeks and my mentor said, there are going to be days you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to roll over and look at Esther and she's going to be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. You're not going to be able to even understand how lucky you are. Those days are the days that you love her with everything in you and you do everything you can to convince her of that love. And then there's going to be days you roll over and you're going to go, what have I done? I don't even like this person. He goes, and those days are the days you love her with everything in you and you do everything you can to convince her of that love. He says, how you feel doesn't change what you do. You love her the same way whether you feel it or you don't feel it. You pour your love out on her no matter what. That's what Ethan is doing. He's saying, when I am just consumed with the promises of God, I, I sing my praises. And when I'm confused and frustrated and angry, I sing my praises. I believe the greatest faith on the planet is the faith that shows up and honors God when nothing makes sense. We've gotten so into apologetics in, in, in Christianity that we think it's our job to come up with philosophical and scientific and even archaeological evidence that undeniably proves the existence of God. And, and it feels like we've reduced Christianity down to this list of truth statements. Here's what I have to believe, this thing. Believing everything, this is my personal belief, believing everything just right and not showing up gets trumped by being confused and frustrated and angry but showing up every time. We've somehow changed the word faith to mean understanding, like when I have no more questions and it all makes sense to me, I have faith. But I think faith looks more like faithfulness. It's saying I've got a million questions and I don't understand anything, but I'm gonna show up and worship God, my creator. I have a thousand questions, but I'm gonna praise the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Ethan goes on this journey that can almost seem bipolar until you step back and realize he hasn't moved. He's right where he started. I'm still showing up to praise God. Am I confused? Absolutely. Am I frustrated? Yes. But I'm going to show up. I'm going to worship God forever. Amen and amen. So how do we respond to this? I think Ethan, the, the Ezraite, gives us some great advice on how to stay faithful in the midst of disconcerting upheaval. His world has been turned upside down, and it's, it's more than just the fact that he's sleeping on the ground when he used to sleep in a palace. His understanding of the way the universe works is in question. And yet at the end, he praises God. And there is a key to his stability. From the beginning of this psalm to the end, Ethan is convinced that God has shown his love to his people by promising them a king. That never changes. Ethan's confused about his current circumstances, but he never doubts God's word. You never hear him say in this psalm, well, clearly you lied. Clearly you didn't promise a king. What creates the confusion is he does not doubt God's word. I know for a fact God's going to send a king because he said he was going to send a king, period. He never doubts God's word. What he does is he questions how his circumstances are ever going to get there. He knows they're going to get there. He just doesn't know how they're going to get there. That's why he's still praising at the end because he knows it's going to wind up here. He's just now confused as to how. He knows God is going to send a king. I think this is huge, especially as we contemplate love in this fourth week of Advent, because here's the thing, the Christian life can be confusing. It can be frustrating. I could probably throw a thousand things at you from the Bible 
that would blow all of our clean, tidy little faith systems to smithereens. And if not, then life will do it. Life will throw you so many curveballs that you'll wonder how it can all be right. We do everything the way we're supposed to, and then it still blows up sometimes. Teenage girls get pregnant the first time they have sex when the last thing they want is a kid, and then these super awesome, faithful families struggle to get pregnant. And they pray and pray and pray. And we sit there going, how can this make any sense? Every single time we try to come up with a formula, something happens to contradict it. And this is why I think the biblical emphasis on love is so important. Because we never, ever have to doubt that God loves us. We can doubt a lot. We can doubt almost everything else. But we cannot doubt that God is a perfect community in need of nothing. And yet motivated by nothing but love, he stepped out of heaven and into a womb. Putting on true and complete humanity with all its pains and degradations and was born for love. He lived for love. He suffered unbelievably for love and died for love. Brent actually opened our service with this this morning. God showed his love. He, just did, he didn't just declare it. He showed it. He's proven that he loves you. No matter how confusing life gets, no matter how frustrating 2020 gets, no matter how broken things seem or how undeniably unjust the world gets and has gotten for 2,000 years, people still gather during famines and plagues and wars and persecutions and sickness and abuse and divorce and bankruptcy and every kind of pain, they've stopped this time of year to remember God did not leave us alone. He did not abandon us. He shows up. You can send it to me. It's the story of Wadworth, Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow was a man who had lost his wife in a horrendous accident where her house coat caught on fire. Shortly thereafter, while he's still in mourning, his oldest son enlists in the Union Army, this is during the Civil War, and was shot. And when Longfellow got the news that his son was shot, he found out he was likely paralyzed. And when he, when he was reading the letter, he can hear the cannon fire not far from his home. So now he's a widower, father of six, with a paralyzed son, and by the sounds of it, his house could be overrun by rebel soldiers any day. In the midst of this hell... Longfellow writes a poem that was later converted and set to music. It says, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat, peace on earth, goodwill to men. He goes on to tell how horrible the world looked. If you read the poem, there's some verses they didn't bother setting to music because they're pretty dark. It was honestly it sounded a lot like Ethan the Ezraite's song. And like Ethan, Longfellow ended his poem like this. He said, And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth. Goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells. Ah, sorry. More loud and deep. God is not dead. Sheesh. Nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail. With peace on earth. Goodwill to men. For 2,000 years, Advent has reminded us, like it did Longfellow, that we are not lost. We are loved. There's not a lot that I can say with absolute certainty. I have very strong theological positions, but I also know I can be wrong on most of them. But I will say with complete and utter positivity that God loves you. He is crazy out of his gourd in love with you. I don't even have to take that by faith because he proved it. He showed it. Ethan had to take by faith that God really would send a king. We don't even have to do that. We get to know for a fact that God loves us and did not leave us alone. 
So whatever metaphor grabs your heart, whether it's a prodigal son or a lost sheep or a rabbi calling an overlooked disciple to follow him or a Jewish teacher talking to a Samaritan woman or an enemy binding the wounds of the downtrodden or Jesus saying that you are his pearl of great price. Whatever metaphor works, grab it and never let it go because God loves you more than, than you could ever dream. And no matter what else happens, when things are confusing, when things don't make sense and they're not adding up and you know what he said and you know what you see and they're not the same, you can hold on to one anchor, but I know God loves me. I may not be able to answer much more, but man, I know God loves me because he sent Jesus to die for me. And although like art, we can create love because that's what we're doing in this series. We're not looking at just how to feel the love of God, but how to create the love of God. And like art, we can do it in endless ways and with endless variety, but I would like to, to suggest this. Just show up. Just show up. One of the most profound words in Christianity is one that we really only pay special attention to this time of year, and that's the word Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. The God who shows up. I know I've been harping on this over and over again, but isolation is dangerous. People need you, and you need people. You might not have all the answers. You, you might um, not have anything to offer but your presence. And I'm here to say that that's enough. That's what you need to give. People need that. Just show up whether it's a Zoom call or a text or, if you're able, a conversation over coffee, but any ministry of presence, just show up. When Jesus talked about the huge judgment at the end of everything in Matthew 25, he says the people who get the big attaboy gave a drink, a meal, a change of clothes, and a visit. Who in this room can't give one of those things? A drink, a meal, a change of clothes, and your presence. None of those people saved the world. In fact, what they did was so small that when Jesus tried to reward them, they didn't even remember it. They just showed up. They showed up. And Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servants. I know right now all eyes are on big powers, the big powers. Who's going to run the country? Who's going to run the Senate? What's the World Health Organization doing? We're, we're, we're looking up in the big stratosphere of power. But Jesus said the people who make the difference are the people who show up for the least. He didn't say anything about what the United Nations is doing in Matthew 25. He says, well, well done, those of you who gave a drink, who shared some water. Well done, those of you who gave some clothes to somebody who didn't have enough. Well done, those of you who visited somebody who was lonely. Just show up. So listen to people you work with. Have a real conversation with them. Show up in that moment. Be present with your kids. Show up. Call and check on your church friends. Completely ignore their privacy and how busy their lives may be and go be Emmanuel to them. Show up. We build love with our presence and right now, maybe more than ever in our entire lifetimes, we need to show up. Because that's how we show love. Let's go to the table.